This is season two of My Only Story. It is a co-production between the My Only Story non-profit company and News24. If you'd like to donate towards our work, please visit our website at myonlystory.org. You can support us in other ways by reviewing, liking, and sharing the podcast and helping to spread the word. You can also engage with us on our social platforms or message us confidentially on 071-382-7030. We'd love to hear from you. It's springtime in Bloemfontein. Guess who's back? It's October 2018, and it's the last month of Thomas Kruger's life. In Bloemfontein, in central South Africa, David McKenzie has already spent four months as water polo coach at Gray College. That's amazing. One Wednesday, David McKenzie receives a message. Thank you very much. The headmaster would like to see him. Enjoy your day. The headmaster wants to know about Dean Carlson. He's the one who was arrested in Australia earlier this year. On Wednesday evening, Mackenzie tells a dear friend all about it. Dean Carlson went to go see the headmaster of Great College. He wants a job. Headmaster called me in today and asked me about this guy, Dean Carlson. It's been about a month since Dean Carlson mysteriously left Pearson High in Port Elizabeth after, as David Mackenzie wrote to many friends, quote, I heard his transgressions eventually caught up, end quote. I couldn't lie, Claire. I feel terrible. I'm only going to tell you this, but I, I didn't sing his praises. Mackenzie does not elaborate, but his friend supports his decision. Hello, David Mackenzie. Her name is Claire Malun. She's a teacher in Cape Town, formerly from Port Elizabeth. And you're random dean there, fucking weirdo. I think it's best if you are honest with your headmaster um, because Dean is trouble and he has proven that over and over again. And although he has his moments where he can be really sweet and kind and nice, he is generally really fucked up. And I would even say like, yeah, just unstable, narcissistic manipulative, fiddles with the boys. <laughs> it's just not, um, I don't think, you just know, you know exactly what's going to happen. It's going to come and things are going to be good to start off with and everybody's going to be so positive and all oh, this experienced coach. And then he just starts to take over and he stops listening to everyone and or anyone and he just does his own shit. And yeah, it's just not worth the pay. Really not worth it. Claire Malun previously known as Claire Hardy, taught and coached polo at Pearson High with both David McKenzie and Dean Carlson, although never at the same time. Dean has made his bed, which he must now lie in, and that's not your fault or your responsibility to sort out his life. He's the one who's colossally fl- fucked up, so don't feel guilty. I would have done It's a addition crossing you fucks. Fuck, driving in Cape Town is a fucking nightmare. Yeah, so don't feel bad about it. I um, I understand what you're saying. I, um, to tell you a little story, I... Last week, Claire Malone told us that her message has an innocent explanation. More on that later. But who is looking after our children if teachers are looking the other way? I'm Dion Wiggett, and this is My Only Story, a podcast and a live investigation. It's October 2021 in Johannesburg, and the water polo season is off to an existential start. There is fire in school's polo pools from the Indian Ocean to the Highveld. And it's about time. It's time we get meaningful answers from Pearson High and Grey High and Grey College and St. Andrew's College in Grahamstown. And also, as of today, we need meaningful answers also from St. Andrew's sister school, DSG, whose grounds start just beyond a fence beyond Espen House on the open St. Andrew's campus. It saddens me to say so today, 
but there's something in the water at DSG 2. On my stoop in Johannesburg, I am sitting with an invaluable helper. Deep Throat, I've called it. The hard drive with nine months' contents of David McKenzie's iPhone. It has allowed me an unparalleled view into the life of an unforgettable teacher and of his memorable friends. Let's meet some of them. You'll be refreshed to know that the years in today's episode are particularly easy to remember. They are the years 2018 to 2021. You know, the two years before the great lockdown started, and the almost two years since. We're beyond David McKenzie's departure from St. Andrew's College, beyond his appointment to Grey College in Bloemfontein, beyond chocolate distribution, beyond Tom Kruger joining Grey PE and visiting McKenzie at Grey College in Bloom. As a matter of fact, we pick up today's story almost exactly three years ago. There is one month left of Thomas Kruger's life. Yeah, he continues at Grey. You know, he actually never played polo at Grey. Oh, no, he did play polo at Grey, but he made the second team. And by then you could just, he was just messing around in the polo pool. He just wasn't interested, you know. But you could see he just had, he had no interest. He, by then he had literally seemed to have no interest in, in anything. Not putting time in with his schoolwork much as we tried to. But we also didn't at the same time want to put him under pressure because we knew how much pressure he'd been under for some other reason. It is in this time that Thomas spends an evening in Port Elizabeth with family friends. They literally lived 50 metres away from us. He got a phone call and he walked away and he was on the phone and next thing she heard this crash and he had thrown his phone into the wall. He was clearly, clearly violently upset about something. Then it is an evening in early spring and we're in the rented Kruger family home in Port Elizabeth. And then he came to us and he says he's really missing college and he thinks he'd like to go back. The first time I spoke to Charles Kruger was almost two years ago now. In that time, I've grown awfully fond of the guy. But I must admit I get exasperated at just how far Charles Kruger had to bend backwards and at just how often Thomas Kruger changed his mind. Nevertheless, in Port Elizabeth, three years ago now, Thomas persists. Eventually, once more, his father relents. He will have to phone the man who rules St. Andrew's College, Headmaster Alan Thompson. Then again, who is really in charge of St. Andrew's College? Sure, it's Headmaster Alan Thompson, but it's not just him. Like at every school in South Africa, the buck truly stops at the school governing body. St. Andrew's has a particularly powerful one, which it refers to as the board. His longtime chairman is Jaco Maria, who was the long, long time CEO of Standard Bank. These days, in addition to leading a school in Grahamstown, Jaco is the chairman of financial services giant Liberty and also a special presidential envoy. Here's Business Day TV in January 2021, not reporting from Davos. The World Economic Forum is underway as a virtual event. Jaco Marie, who's investment envoy to President Ramaphosa, joins us now with more of that detail. Jaco, thanks so much for your time this evening. From a socially distant studio in Johannesburg, Business Day talks to Jaco Maria in a socially distant study in an undisclosed location that is not Switzerland. How much of that Davos impact has been lost? I must say, it, it, it does feel very strange not being in the snow and with lots of people around you, but this is the world that we're in. By all indications, Jacko has settled nicely into his role as presidential envoy. Then again, he was expecting it to happen, he tells 702's Bruce Whitfield back in 2018. I suspected I was going to get a phone call after President Ramaphosa was elected to do something. I had no idea what it would be, and this is what it turned out to be. But over the years, through the investment roadshows and the moneyed slopes of Davos, Jacko has remained a hands-on chairman to St. Andrew's College. Indeed, three weeks ago, he told us that Headmaster Thompson kept him entirely up to speed about all complaints against David McKenzie. Too formal, too informal. We'll delve into the entire value chain of command, 
in our final episode next week. As we delve deeper into David McKenzie's time in Bloemfontein, I want to issue a blanket assurance. To any potential survivors still at Grey College and also at Red and Bedford View and at St Andrews College, you have my word. You will not be involved in the rest of this podcast at all. Do not worry about checking the news. There's no hammer that will fall. Focus on your exams. Talk to a therapist when you can. Be kind to yourself and do not succumb to shame. You did nothing wrong. So, in order to protect these children, we're mostly looking at Mackenzie's time in Bloemfontein as it relates to his relationships with the teachers and children of St. Andrew's College and, of course, of his colleagues at schools all over, from the polo pool to the stage. Yes, I know, we're all enjoying some terrific water polo, but I'd like to segue into a bit of drama. And so I simply must introduce you to a drama teacher from Grahamstown. Hello, my beautiful human, Wesley Danky. The beautiful human's name is Wesley Danky. Yeah, it's a weird name. Wesley Danky. D-E-I-N-T-J-E. How are you? Are you looking forward to your holiday? I'm sure you are. What are your plans? How are you going? Give me some information. I feel like it's the one-way relationship. Can you please talk to me? Three years ago, Wesley Denke was the drama teacher at DSG. He taught the grade eights and grade nines of St. Andrew's College too, and directed stage productions, like this one, as recalled by St. Andrew's headmaster Alan Thompson in his celebrated address of 2015. A really progressive and challenging production of Metamorphosis, which was a joint production with the girls from DSG and our boys from college. It went down well. It was a challenging piece but played to great reviews and is actually going to be uh, one of the productions staged at the National Arts Festival. So a wonderful success on the dramatic front. Our music is doing well. When Wesley Denke responds to David McKenzie's message, regrettably it's not by voice note, so I have to read it out. Quote, Hey, hey, my love. How are you doing? Nothing exciting going here. End quote. Next message. Quote, How are you? End quote. We return to David McKenzie. But if Wesley Denke is feeling blue in Grahamstown, Mackenzie is bubbling over in Bloemfontein. Oh, Wes, I'm so good. I'm so happy at the moment. And I'm just, I'm buzzing. I'm buzzing, but I'm fucking out of Grahamstown. And I'm really living now. I'm living, I know I'm in Bloemfontein, but I'm living. It's better than where I was. And yeah, I just miss you. And I miss my friends there. And I miss some of the boys. Yeah. And then Mackenzie asks Wesley Denke about his love life. How's the love life? How's, how's how the men treating you these days? You still got that boy, that day, that, that baby, I don't know what you call him, but that person. If you couldn't quite make out that last bit, Mackenzie says, quote, How are the men treating you these days? Have you still got that boy, that bay, that baby? I don't know what you call him, slash that person. End quote. Wesley Denke responds, quote, Missing you too, Chop. Boy is good, but you're still my one allowance. End quote. But if you're finding this exchange suspect, let me take you later in the year 2018. In a few months' time, Mackenzie will get married. In the meantime, he's been busy posting pictures on Facebook and on Instagram. As is often the case, the pictures are of high school boys in speedos. Wesley Denke writes to David McKenzie, quote, Stop taking pics of the boys in their speedos. You're supposed to love me. How goes it, lover? End quote. McKenzie writes back, quote, Ha ha ha, sorry. These Dutch men are fucking ripped as fuck. End quote. Then McKenzie sends Wesley Denke a picture he found on Instagram. It's of a grey college schoolboy and he's only dressed in underwear. Wesley Denke writes back, quote, How old is this person before I perv? End quote. McKenzie answers, quote, He is 18, two emojis laughing diagonally, end quote. 
Wesley, quote, but in high school, end quote. McKinsey says yes, and Denki says, quote, haha, then I will refrain from commenting. Most Afrikaners are so repressed, it comes out in weird ways, like cottage gardens, unknown men in dodgy bathroom stops, or real bondage, end quote. David McKinsey writes back, quote, wish you could meet my polo team, boys with issues up to their ears. I don't miss my life in Grahamstown at all. Emoji laughing diagonally, end quote. In this podcast, we've stated over and over again that any suspected infringements by teachers must be reported to the South African Council for Educators. SACE, for short. But once a complaint is sent to SACE, who is the one who receives it? I am George Morasi. It's an exotic surname, don't mind it. Duly employed by the South African Council for Educators. Every complaint in the country lands on my desk. The SA Council for Educators was established under legislation 21 years ago. Since then, its mission has often been thwarted by casual ignorance, or the casual ignoring of, the serious obligations the law imposes on teachers. Suppose I'm a teacher and it comes to my attention that a learner is being sexually abused. You have the responsibility to report that abuse, failing which you are attracting a criminal conviction. And there will be questions asked. George says that SACE understands the protocols within schools. As for protocol, we know you will go to your principal. You will notify your principal to say this has been brought to my attention. And the principal has to escalate it. You cannot keep it to yourself. We'll open a file, we'll allocate a case number, and we'll notify the complainant if possible, because some of them are anonymous. If possible, we'll notify you, thank you. This is the case number we're following up. In order to teach in South Africa, you need to register and then retain your registration with SACE. I asked George what will happen if SACE finds a teacher guilty of sex abuse. There is no other sanction except for the removal of an educator's name from the register, indefinitely. Then I asked George a question to which we all know the answer by now. Once a teacher reports abuse to the headmaster, can the headmaster just deal with it? It is extremely wrong of a principal or any other educator to try and manage the process from within. It's unacceptable and we owe it upon learners to protect them. In the event a school principal attempts to keep things under wraps, unfortunately the consequences are unpleasant. As a principal, you are CEO of an institution, so you cannot say I did not know if it has been brought to our attention or I was merely trying to make peace. It's unacceptable. The buck stops with you. But now, back to our water polo coverage. And boy, oh boy, both sides are looking fit. It is three years ago, October 2018, and polo season is in full swing. David McKenzie is coaching from the pool at Grey College in Bloemfontein, but he still wants to call the shots in the lives of some boys he left in the middle of the year. He pokes, he blabs, he meddles, he maneuvers. For instance, one night, a boy asks McKenzie about a girl. The boy writes, quote, I'm trying to slide in, but don't tell anyone, end quote. McKenzie reverts with the inside scoop. I promise you, obviously, to leave this voice note. The woman we're talking, she really wanted a good guy. Someone's going to treat her well, and she really likes talking to you. So, for me, it sounds like an in. If Mackenzie seems pleased to help, it's more than that. As a matter of fact, he seemingly insists on being consulted when anyone starts dating anyone. For instance, here he climbs into someone else. Exactly. Have I met her yet? Have I greeted her? Have I approved of her? These are all things that you should take into consideration before choosing some female. Excuse me. And then it gets darker still. 
David McKenzie has just received a message from a boy inquiring about a drama teacher who he believes has been making eyes at him. It's Wesley Denke. Here is McKenzie's advice to the boy. Please make sure that you don't get on Denke's bad side because then it's going to be super shit. Start fitting in with him right now. Yes, that's McKenzie telling a schoolboy to start flirting with his teacher, Mr. Denke. Start fitting in with him right now. The boy writes back, quote, Yeah, he loves me already, sir. He wants my dick. Emoji that's crying with laughter. End quote. But even while Mackenzie is meddling in Grahamstown, he has plenty on his own plate too. When spring is over, he will be joined in holy matrimony to his fiancée. But in the meantime, he still has plenty of other plans. Here he is talking to a friend. So my bachelor party is coming up soon, the 17th of November. Interesting date. I wish you were coming, but alas, I don't feel like drama. The friend responds. I don't think that would cause drama if I was there. It would be way more fun if I was there, let me know it. Yes, it is clear, Malan. One thing I know how to do is a party. By Claire's own admission last week, they were extremely close friends. Just how close? Another exchange makes me wonder. It's from a few months before Mackenzie left St. Andrews College. The conversation happened in writing, and I'm terrible at accents, so you'll have to imagine their distinctive voices in both of their parts. At lunchtime one day, Claire writes, David? Mackenzie writes, All good, sea hards. I'm going to pull my shit together. Claire writes, Who were you with yesterday? Mackenzie, Some of my mates. I coached them a couple of years ago. Claire, Oh, they look like schoolboys! Three exclamation marks. I was like, Eek, Dave! Two exclamation marks. Then Mackenzie writes, Ha ha ha, yeah, I don't do that anymore. Claire Malone responds, Thank goodness. And now, here we are back in Grahamstown, at St. Andrews College and at DSG. The countdown to the annual Great Fish River journey has started. Soon, the grade tens of two historic schools will spend 21 days on a journey from the source of the Great Fish River in the Karoo to its mouth on the Indian Ocean, where the children will chant and then chant some more as they dive through the waves of the sea, like in this audio from 2016. As preparations for journey are finalized, and as David McKenzie continues to meddle, Thomas Kruger has made up his mind. He wants to go back to his friends, back to Espen House and St. Andrew's College. And so shall Kruger bite the bullet. Somewhat sheepishly, he phones headmaster Alan Thompson. He says straight away, Tom's place is and has always still been open at college, and we'd love to have him back. I'd like to meet you. I'm flying out for a meeting in Johannesburg tomorrow morning. Could we meet at the airport in Port Elizabeth for coffee, which we duly did? We sit and chat to Alan Thompson about Tom wanting to return to St. Andrews College. Alan Thompson is adamant that for Tom to return, it's very important that he attends Journey which we say we also think that that's a very good thing for him to do. And we agree to it. All the pieces are now in place. Thomas will go back to St. Andrews, go back for journey and for his final days. We are in the Eastern Cape where the drought has not lifted for seven years. It has led to a litany of tragedy, like this inferno four years ago. 
This is Janine Lee on SABC News. The fire is still not under control. The fire department are basically, um, they, for want of a better phrase, they are putting out fires where they are at that time. The fire has reached secluded Woodridge College, a private school about 40 minutes outside Port Elizabeth. Almost 50% of the buildings at Woodridge College have been burnt. Teachers were trying to save what they could. The visuals are as terrifying as you would imagine. Smart and stately buildings disappearing under flames. The only probably good thing to say at this stage is that the wind has died down. The wind this afternoon was the catalyst. Things were under control until that wind came up at gale force speed midday. Until the wind changed, it seemed like Woodridge was safe. They evacuated people, scholars, teachers and horses as a precautionary measure. They were hoping that the fire had passed and then with the gale force wind, that situation changed in a heartbeat. Once more, as has been the case in the Eastern Cape, the wish remains the same. The only thing at this stage that can put these fires out in Port Elizabeth and surrounding areas will be heavy rain. Woodridge has rebuilt But in the past week, it's been forced to come clean. The school's surprising U-turn over the past few weeks gives me real faith in the power of parents in these dark polo times. Here's how it happens. Last month, headmaster Derek Bradley sends a short little letter to parents. It reads, quote, I would like to inform the Woodridge community that Mr. Ryan Skippers and Mr. Ricky Helber have tendered their resignations with immediate effect. We wish them well in their future endeavours. We would like to assure parents that we have contingency plans in place to cover their areas of responsibility. College sports-related communication can be sent to name and address. Mr. Opperman will contact boarding residence parents under separate cover. That's 72 words, or 76 if you count dear parents and yours sincerely. The letter is signed by Headmaster Derek Bradley, who has had to deal with fire before. Six years ago, he takes up the reins as headmaster of Parktown Boys High in Johannesburg. In a YouTube video from 2015, he talks about his dreams for his administration. I have a very good feeling about the school. My plan for Parktown would be to make it the school of choice in Johannesburg. Over nearly a hundred years, it's been one of the outstanding boys' schools in South Africa. So really for me, it's going to be the school of choice and that will be my my drive and uh, my motivation to get it there. But it was not to be. In Derek Bradley's second year in office, the school gets drenched in water polo scandal. A rape and sexual assault case involving a former Pucktown Boys High School water polo coach has been postponed. SABC News again. A 22-year-old man made a brief appearance in the Johannesburg Magistrates Court this morning. There are two reasons I bring up Parktown Boys High at this point. The first and obvious reason is that the scandals at Parktown Boys High and at Woodridge, both occurred on the watch of the same headmaster, Derek Bradley. But there's another reason. At the moment, Colin Rex is the nation's most notorious underwater predator. In the end, he pleaded guilty to 144 counts of sex abuse. Five years ago, long before his day in court, The story of Parktown Boys High broke. The accused was an assistant boarding master who also coached water polo. The nation was furious. But the people in charge, in this instance the Gauteng Education Department, may as well have been reading from a hymn sheet. No disciplinary action has been taken against him because he resigned voluntarily. If this is sounding familiar to you, it's because it should. When David McKenzie faced a disciplinary hearing at St Andrews College, he also resigned with immediate effect. The principal since then has been providing psychological support and the school has instituted an investigation. Another spokesperson even trots out some victim blaming. Our concern was that uh, how can the learners not come out with uh, such an incident that uh, we really are concerned about. The department is looking at ways to change the culture of silence. Mehla Kukomani, SABC News, Johannesburg. And then, just as the news is breaking, the headmaster of Parktown Boys High, Derek Bradley, accepts a new posting and moves to the Eastern Cape. By April 2017, he's headmaster Bradley of the elite Woodridge College. In just two months' time, 
a fire will tear through the school. And then, last month, a new fire reached the Woodridge campus. And this time, it's not the wind that's to blame. Last month, after Headmaster Bradley sends a short letter, the parents of Woodridge say, not so fast. And so, last week, the governing body and Headmaster Bradley write another letter to parents. This time, the letter is three pages long, and it would have been four pages long if the font size wasn't so tiny and the leading not so tight. In the first paragraph of the third, in the first paragraph of the 1,300 word letter, the school immediately makes clear that only one of the two departed teachers was a real teacher. The other one, quote, was a non-teaching member of staff and therefore not subject to registration, end quote. That's registration with SACE. Both of the staff members, the school says, resigned with immediate effect. The real teacher resigned following, quote, allegations of misconduct purportedly perpetrated nearly a decade ago, end quote. The non-teaching member of staff was a sports coach. The school writes, quote, Insofar as the non-teaching member of staff is concerned, it is necessary to emphatically state that no complaint whatsoever was levelled against the staff member in question. The resignation was precipitated following upon it having come to the school's attention that an unrelated incident was alleged to have occurred similarly nearly a decade ago, and which, if demonstrated to be true, may have amounted to a breach of the school's policies and may have constituted sufficiently serious misconduct to warrant the dismissal of the staff member concerned. End quote. Then, last Saturday... A fabulous scoop for the Herald in P.E. According to the Herald, here's what happened. Last month, a psychologist phones Woodridge College. According to the Herald, the psychologist reports something distressing. There's an accusation of sexual misconduct from 2012. When confronted with the allegation, the teacher concerned resigned immediately. He is former water polo coach Ryan Skippers who was also the housemaster of one of the boarding houses. And the non-teaching member of staff? Well, he was the school's head of sport, Mr. Ricky Helber, in addition to administrating all the school's sport. He also coached cricket and hockey. He also resigned immediately. This past week, someone else found themselves in hot water. It is Claire Malone. Unstable, narcissistic, manipulative, fiddles with the boys. <laughs> Claire Malone, previously Claire Hardy, used to coach water polo with Mackenzie at Pearson High in Windy Summer Strand. This week, News24 asked Claire what is up with that voice note. She says, quote, I believed that Dean was not fit to be in a position where he worked alongside children. I was of the opinion that he had been involved in inappropriate interactions with school children in the past, which was both disturbing and alarming to me. My anxious and nervous laugh played out in the podcast was because of the fact that these types of transgressions make me incredibly uncomfortable. End quote. Claire Milan says when she was at Pearson, she reported her concerns to, quote, high authority within the school. End quote. She adds, Quote, I believe that as an educator, you have a responsibility to protect and act in a child's best interest at all times. This is something I take very seriously. I am unaware of any legal duties imposed on me to report any such allegations. However, I felt that I had a moral obligation to do so, which I did at the time. End quote. She says that she does not, in fact, know why Dean Carlson left Pearson High. She assumed it had something to do with a boy. Quote, This was a baseless claim made by me, and I had no evidence of this at the time. I had, and still have, no knowledge of any relationship he may have had with any student. End quote. Claire Malan currently teaches at Cedar House in Cape Town. She tells News24 that she did inform her current employer that she was featured in this podcast. No, she didn't, says her current employer. In response to questions from News24, the principal of Cedar House provides a masterclass in responsive action. Headmistress Gail Gubb said Claire had not notified the school. We asked her if the school condones Claire's comments, and she says, 
Quote, no, we certainly do not. The comments are unacceptable. End quote. She adds, quote, the school was unaware of any of these allegations until your email. We are taking advice as to whether any action can and should be taken against her. End quote. Meanwhile, Wesley Denke's employer is even more displeased. The headmistress of Cape Town's Herschel Girls School, Heather Goodicke, has suspended Wesley Denke. She told News24, quote, Mr. Denke is on a precautionary suspension in order to allow the school to institute an investigation into the circumstances of his previous employment and the persons he may or may not have interacted with during such times, end quote. Headmistress Goodicke says the school conducted extensive reference checks when Denke was employed. Quote, Our standard procedure is to undertake extensive reference checking, which we did in this case. No negative responses were given by any of his references or previous employers. In fact, the references were extremely positive with respect to his ability and delivery as an English teacher. He came highly recommended. End quote. We thank the principals of both Cedar House and Herschel Girls School for their candor, transparency and demonstrated intent to take a stand for children's safety. And so, once more, we are back in Grahamstown, back on steep Somerset Street. And it is last week. As the water polo season heats up, distressing news rocks the administration of headmaster Yanni de Villiers. The distressing news, I think it's fair to say, is us. You see, drama coach Wesley Denke is not the only teacher whose conduct we report today in the public interest. There's another good friend of both Mackenzie and Danke, but unlike either of them, this teacher is still employed in Grahamstown. Would you like to guess what sport he coaches? Do I even have to say it? Fine, I'll say it. Today, we identify water polo coach Mark Evans in the public interest. He is being investigated by the SA Council for Educators after reports of inappropriate touching by five young women who were minors at the time. According to one of the accounts, all five are substantially identical. Mark Evans would touch her inappropriately while coaching water polo. To obscure their identities further, I will not quote from their interviews, but paraphrase. Mark Evans would use their swimsuits to demonstrate certain water polo movements. He would grab girls and push them around, often grabbing their breasts in the process. The young woman says Mark Evans would also grab their swimsuits over the crotch and inner thighs. In total, Evans is said to have touched schoolgirls' chests, breasts, hips, inner thighs and groins. And also that he would kiss them on the forehead or in the face during practices. Someone else mentioned he would often make inappropriate comments about their bodies, specifically their hips, thighs and breasts. And then, it is yesterday evening. Headmaster Yanni de Villiers has finally decided to break his silence on Mark Evans. In his statement to News24, Headmaster de Villiers says, quote, As a matter of policy and principle, DSG does not disclose confidential employer-employee matters, including disciplinary processes, in the public domain. We can confirm, however, that a teacher at the school has been placed on precautionary suspension. DSG has appointed a leading South African law firm to assist us in this matter and advise on the allegations raised by News24 over the past number of days. For the record, the suspended teacher did not attend any school camps last week nor participate in any other school activities or events due to other commitments. He will not participate in any school event for the duration of the precautionary suspension. End quote. The principal says that DSG, quote, takes its duty of care to its pupils and staff very seriously and is committed to providing a safe and inclusive environment for all of our girls. We remain vigilant and committed to acting firmly and decisively if we become aware of any reportable events." End quote. You can read DSG's full response at news24.com, but here's the closing sentence. Quote, we would never knowingly or willfully permit 
nor condone any conduct by an educator or member of our support staff that could compromise our duty of care to the girls of DSG. End quote. Last weekend, DSG's lawyers sent our lawyers a letter an hour before midnight. It confirmed the DSG had instituted an inquiry into allegations against Mark Evans. An independent advocate will conduct a review, the school says. In the meantime, Mark Evans has been suspended from DSG. At the beginning of 2020, Mark Evans suddenly stopped coaching water polo at DSG. Ever since, he's been coaching the boys of St. Andrew's College. Coaching the boys at the sparkling water polo pool with its view of three small windows of the depressing two-story sanatorium. The sanatorium where Thomas Kruger took his final decision three years ago next month. Earlier this year, I am on my stoop in Johannesburg with the brand new plaything that I have nicknamed Deep Throat, even though it has none of the charm of the original. I'm poking around its insides as I try to piece together the final weeks of Thomas Kruger's life. Just after midnight on Sunday, 18 November 2018, Thomas will hang himself. As I find my way around the trove that is Deep Throat, I head straight for the middle of November. And then I hit a snag. In many ways, you can say David McKenzie is married to WhatsApp. It provides an almost blow-by-blow -blow account of his life. To all and sundry, he chronicles what he had for lunch or when he's gone for a run, or the time when he got access to an airport lounge in Johannesburg. At least two dozen people received a shot from the slow lounge at our tumble. He whispers affection to boys of St. Andrew's College and of Grey College. He makes plans to see them in secret. He organizes outings and asks about people's holiday plans and argues with pupils and argues with teachers and blows hot and cold with schoolboys who are desperate for his approval. Oh, and don't you dare take an instant to respond. If you do, he'll send you the letter P over and over again. It's a teenage thing. If someone does not respond instantly, you keep sending the letter P for ping. The recipient's phone will ping and ping and ping until they pay attention. One evening at 8.31, Mackenzie sends someone a WhatsApp. They don't respond immediately, so in what is left of 8.31, Mackenzie sends a P for ping 18 times. By 8.49, he sent three more messages. 11 minutes later, at 9 p.m., the recipient responds. In less than half an hour, they've received 22 messages from David McKenzie. At 9 p.m., the recipient responds to the most recent question, quote, why are you ignoring me, end quote. The response, quote, I was in the kitchen, end quote. All of which I mentioned to say that David McKenzie is close to his WhatsApp. In the first weeks of November, his upcoming bachelor's party takes up much attention. It is scheduled to be held at his fiancée's family's holiday home in St. Francis Bay, maybe 90 minutes' drive from P.E. On Saturday, 17 November 2018, David McKenzie and select guests arrive in St. Francis Bay for a bachelor's party to remember. As the going gets wilder, Tom Kruger is getting ready. He is in the sanatorium of St. Andrew's College. As Saturday slips into Sunday, Mackenzie parties hard as Thomas slips away. And then it's Sunday morning. The party is over and Thomas is dead. I can't tell you how Mackenzie hears the news or how he responds. I don't know who he calls next or WhatsApps in consternation. None of that data is to be found on his iPhone. Two weeks of Mackenzie's phone has been deleted. From the morning Tom is discovered, 18 November, until two weeks later, when all that's left of Thomas is Ash. 
if David McKenzie deliberately deleted two weeks of his WhatsApp history. There's a long history before then that maybe he kept for sentiment's sake. His WhatsApp history with Thomas Kruger. And the message that he sent to Tom three days before the boy died. Next time, season finale of My Only Story. It's been a tough month of live investigation for all of us, but I think it's fair to say it's been a much tougher month for the water polo community. And trust me, it's just the tip of the iceberg. Last week, News24 sent a detailed list of questions to Mark Evans. He said he was, quote, both devastated and deeply concerned by the innuendo contained therein. Given the potential prejudice to my reputation and my chosen and much-loved career, you will appreciate that I have been compelled to seek appropriate legal advice. Until and unless otherwise advised, I elect politely to decline responses to your individual questions, save to indicate in the strongest terms that I deny any wrongdoing of any nature whatsoever. I accordingly reserve my rights." End quote. On Monday this week, we sent more questions. Polar coach Mark Evans responded yesterday afternoon, quote, Thank you for your WhatsApp dated 18 October, which has been referred to DSG for their reply, should they so wish. I have been advised that the terms of my suspension prohibit me from responding to your queries, and I will therefore not be doing so, suffice to once again deny any wrongdoing on my behalf. End quote. Also on Monday, Wesley Denke received a set of questions from News24. He did not respond, and when we finally reached him on the phone yesterday afternoon, he said his lawyers had advised him not to speak to us. Dean Carlos's lawyers went one step further. Carlos himself couldn't answer our questions. He's still behind bars in Australia. But his lawyers have finally got back to us. Quote, Hi, we can confirm that Mr. Carlos is our client. We do not, however, wish to make a statement. Please cease contacting our firm regarding this matter. Thank you in advance. End quote. The season of My Only Story finishes next week, but our investigations will continue. But in the meantime, there are pressing questions to answer. The meaning of the bacon emoji. The difficulty with stroke correction. Oh, and something called cooking club. David McKenzie started a fake cooking club not long before he left St. Andrews. What was cooking at Cooking Club? We'll try to answer that and much more in our final episode. My Only Story is written and edited by me, Dion Wiggett. The executive producer is Alison Pope. The associate producer is Noctula Magnati. And the sound engineer is Sean Jeffress. The original score is by Charles Johann Lingenfelder. Our artwork is by Kala Kvirsa. Additional reporting by News 24's Cecil Nguyen Trakamba. Their production manager is Charlene Ruet, and their editor-in-chief, Adrian Basson, is our editorial advisor. Special thanks to Sheldon Marias and Paula Barifa. Whoever you are, please continue sending me your information and your tip-offs. You can contact me completely confidentially at myonlystory.org or message us on WhatsApp or Telegram on 071 382-7030. MyOnlyStory.org is also the place to go for bonus materials and loads of resources about recovering from sexual abuse. At MyOnlyStory.org, there are loads of links to people to talk to, depending on where you are in the world. If you're in South Africa, you can always, always phone SADAG on 0800-456-789. It's sequential and easy to remember. 0800-456-789. 789. Subscribe on your favorite podcast app and follow the developments all week long at news24.com. This project was supported by Truth First and is made possible by contributions from people like you. This has been a co-production of the My Only Story non-profit company and News24.